family and the vision of a family who shares a passion for bringing nationally renowned healthcare experts to inspire and educate our community. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to thank so many of you who partner with us and give to support the health and care of our community. To our friends of the hospital, we are especially grateful for your partnership. Your generosity is pivotal to the superior medical care and health of our community. We are proud of our recent work to bring 3D mammography, minimally invasive spine surgery, along with significant investments in staff education who keep our hospital running and community health programs. Presently, we're working hard to bring a pediatrician to our community and raise funds for breast MRI technology, which will help with the detection of breast cancer, and also fund a compassionate care program which, serve, which helps the underserved. <clears throat> it is our commitment to invest in hope and healing that brings us all here tonight. At this time, it is a privilege to introduce Dr. Bredesen. Dr. Bredesen is internationally recognized as a neurodegenerative disease expert. His research is changing the approach to the prevention, diagnosis, and management of Alzheimer's. He earned his medical degree from Duke University and went on to serve as chief resident in neurology at the University of California, San Francisco. He has held faculty positions at three University of California schools and directed the program on aging at the Burnham Institute. He later went on to be the founding president and CEO of the Buck Institute for Research on Aging. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Dale Bredesen. Thank you very much, appreciate that. I figured you could make comments there from the seat if you want. All right, so. Well, thank you so much, Megan. Thank you, and thanks to Betsy, and thanks to everyone here uh, for having me today. And, and I apologize for the fires. I'm sorry about that. Uh, and I hope everyone's uh, staying safe. Um, and I'd like to talk to you over the next few minutes about what we've been doing for the last 30 years. So I was a laboratory neurologist um, who left clinical practice uh, almost 30 years ago because we couldn't make anybody better. And we wanted to know what can we do how can we understand the phenomenon of neurodegeneration in enough detail that we could begin to fashion the very first effective treatments? Because as you know, this has been the area of greatest biomedical failure. As they say, everybody knows a cancer survivor, no one knows an Alzheimer's survivor. I'm gonna show you the first ones today, and I described these in the book, which was uh, on the New York Times uh, bestseller list for five months, and it's coming out in 26 languages this year, so we're very excited about that. So let me just ask everybody here, how many people here want to avoid Alzheimer's? <laughs> okay, yeah. So how many people here know you're fasting insulin? Okay, not too many. How many people know your HSCRP? How many people know your serum iodine? Okay, how many people know your C4A? All right, how many know if you have any urinary mycotoxins? All right, good, a few people. How many know your APOE status? A few people. So this is the point here, that just as Years ago, we found out it's really important to know your cholesterol, and now your LDL, and now your LDL particle number, and your HDL. How many people here know your cholesterol? See, just about everybody. What I'm gonna show you today, same idea. It's just that the brain is a little more complicated than the heart, so there are other things that you need to know, but they tell you what's actually going on, and they tell you what your risk for developing cognitive decline. And here's the most important thing about today. Nobody here should get cognitive decline. It should actually be a rare disease. This disease that is now the third leading cause of death in the United States, and actually in the United Kingdom, number one cause of death is cognitive decline, dementia. 
So this shouldn't be. We should be able to see it coming, and we now have ways that I'll show you to do that. So let's talk about this. So the bottom line here is medicine is undergoing a revolution. And unfortunately, most of the doctors are still practicing 20th century medicine. And unfortunately, we are dying of 21st century diseases. A century ago, we were mostly dying from simple infectious illnesses, tuberculosis, diphtheria, things like that. And the strategy was fairly simple. You get a drug, you, get to, you target the bug, and you're okay. The problem is we tried to use that same approach for complex chronic illnesses. They are fundamentally different. So we were using our checkers strategy for a chess match. It does not work, as we know. Alzheimer's, no real treatment for it. So we're dying of these because we're still practicing old-fashioned medicine. So I thought this was really interesting. How many people here have heard about the X Prize? So the X Prize, really interesting, and the X Prize has done some fantastic stuff. They've improved ways to clean up oil spills, for example. And of course, the very first X Prize was the Ansari X Prize, and that was to put a person into space, you had to do it twice in one week. And interestingly, most people don't realize the original requirement was they had to go up 100 miles. Nobody could do that. So they surreptitiously changed the goal to 100 kilometers. So if you look it up now, you'll see that you had to put a person 100 kilometers into space. Now, what was interesting, the engineer realized nobody had the technology to do that. And he realized all of the things that were standard approaches all of them failed. So he, what he said was really interesting. He said he realized that whatever the solution was gonna be the one that was gonna make it work so that you could actually put someone up over 100 kilometers twice in a week was going to sound crazy when it was first brought up because they already knew all the standard stuff didn't work. And so, sure enough, the idea that he came up with, which is the one that actually won them the prize, was that he's gonna build a spaceship that changed shape as it flew. So they had one shape for going up, basically, and one shape for coming down. And of course, when, that, when he first said it, they said, that's crazy, it's turned out to be the winning idea. So we're very much in the same sort of place with Alzheimer's disease and neurodegenerative diseases. We know the drug trials are all failing. We know the standard approach. You go into your doctor today, you say, I have Lou Gehrig's disease. He says, I'm sorry. You go in for Alzheimer's, and I liken this to taking your car in. Imagine you take your car in. It's not working very well. Mechanic says, oh, I know what this is. This is car not working syndrome. And you say, well, wait a minute. You know, aren't you going to do some tests on the car? And he said, well, no, those tests aren't reimbursed. And that's exactly what's happening with cognitive decline. They say it's Alzheimer's. That really doesn't mean much. It's just a name. You say, well, where did it come from? Why did I get it? Well, we don't know. Well, can I fix it? We don't think so. So things have to change here, and that's what we've been doing for 30 years in the laboratory. And I should say, when we started this, my wife, who's an integrative physician, said to me, you know, whatever you guys find in the test tube is gonna have something to do with basic things like what you've eaten and your nutritional status and whether you're exercising and all of a sudden I said, no, 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 you know, because I knew better, right? I said, no, we're gonna find one molecule, one fold, one region of one protein, and we're gonna get a drug for that and everything's gonna be fine. So when we worked out the molecular biology over the next 30 years, it turned out she was right. I was wrong. I should have listened to her 25 years ago. So we, what we found is really different than what people have been thinking about Alzheimer's disease, as I'll show you today. So if you look at neurodegenerative diseases, this is, as I said, arguably the area of greatest biomedical failure, billions of dollars spent with no success, and it really forces a, a reconsideration of how we think about translating scientific information into new therapies. So there's a quote here from Francis Crick. He was one of the two guys who figured out the DNA double helix and got the Nobel Prize for that. And he said, resist the temptation to work so hard that there's no time left for serious thinking. And there's been a lot of hard work on Alzheimer's, but maybe not quite enough serious thinking. So, 
we treat this without knowing the cause. This has been a real problem. Doctors write you a prescription for Alzheimer's disease without telling you what the heck happened. Why did you get it? Searching for the cause as if it's only one. As I'll show you today, we discovered that there are many contributors. It's very different than what people thought. They use monotherapeutics. That's you know, one drug. Uniform treatment, same thing for each person. Why? We're not all the same. We're very different, each one of us. So why would you think that the best way to treat this untreatable disease is going to be to do the exact same thing for each person? Single phase. Why would you think that you're going to treat it with one thing and then that's the thing that's going to be the same, the best thing forever? Maybe you need to do it in phases. Maybe you need to change it. Maybe it needs to be different for each person. All of these things are open and possible and they've been ignored. We just write one prescription, boom, that's what you're going to have. And then thinking, hey, the best way to go is going to be to give a drug. These large, expensive, some of these clinical trials cost $50 million. So we have, in fact, spent billions and billions of dollars on failed drug trials. Why, why are we doing this? And then we target the mediators. People say, oh, Alzheimer's is caused by amyloid in your brain. No, it's not caused by that. That is a mediator of the problem. Something upstream, something that's happening to us is causing this disease, and that's what we want to look at. The amyloid is just a mediator. So we're trying to get rid of it, and of course, that doesn't work. Then the other thing is, when you've got nothing that works, there's something called in statistics the floor effect. When you're at the bottom, nothing's helping, you might get something that actually helps a little, but you can't tell because it's so far down, you can't see a change. For example, if you go from you know, minus four to minus two, to, you know, you're looking at the zero, it still looks like nothing happened. So we now can bring people up to what's the dynamic range. We can now see things that make a little help or a little hurt. So I really believe we will look back on this era as the dark ages of searching for neurodegenerative disease cures because we were assuming all these things and not really thinking about how does this work. So that's what we've spent the last 30 years doing. And I should mention uh, Bob Buck because his family was the one that actually supported the Buck Institute for Research on Aging, where I was the founding president, I was fortunate enough to be the founding president back in 1998. And we did a lot of the work that I will talk about today uh, at the Buck Institute. So thanks very much to Bob and to Mary Jane and to Bob's family for the tremendous risk that they took to put money into an institute that was trying to break the mold on understanding aging and age-related diseases. So I want to give you two minutes of medical school here because most doctors are not looking at this. Here's the thing. When you get a disease, there are, as you know, many factors. Human beings are complicated, as you know. But if you have something like pneumococcal pneumonia, and this was what was killing many people last century, and of course we can do pretty well with antibiotics now, there are lots of things. If you are taking alcohol, you, may, you have an increased risk of getting. If you have diabetes mellitus, you have an increased risk for getting pneumococcal pneumonia. If you are B cells, these are some of your lymphocytes, are not particularly good. For example, if you have multiple myeloma, you are at increased risk for that. All sorts of other things. But the most important thing by far is the organism itself. So even though it's a complex illness, we as physicians can get away with treating you simply by dealing with one thing. Whoops, here we go, there. So we can give you an antibiotic and ignore all these other things. That's not the way it works with complex chronic illnesses. They don't have the one feature that's so far above everything else that you can ignore everything else. So when you get Alzheimer's, it's partly your insulin resistance. It's partly that you've been exposed to specific pathogens. It's partly that you have inflammation activated, something called NF-kappa B. It's partly that you may have been exposed to mercury, both organic and inorganic. It's partly that you might have been exposed to mycotoxins, so we need to evaluate all these things. 
various other organisms, your homocysteine, and you can go on and on. We initially identified 36. There are probably going to be more like 50 or so. We have a few more we've identified now, but it's not thousands. The good news is it's several dozen. Okay, but the difference is, unlike pneumococcal pneumonia, they're all giving you contributions. So the more of these that we can get at, the better chance we have to prevent it and to reverse it. And I'll show you uh, unprecedented examples of people who have improved. So that's the key. We tell people, imagine you have a roof with 36 holes in it. And in fact, a drug is really good for one hole, very good patch for one hole, but you still have 35 more holes. So what you have to do is you have to find all the holes and you have to patch the various holes. And when you do that, people get better. So where we stand today, as you know, it's a really sad state of affairs. Patients often don't seek medical care, as you know, because they think nothing can be done. So they wait and wait and wait, way too long. And of course, they finally go to their primary care provider, and what does he or she do? They say, well, look, I don't need to send you to a neurologist because I can just write a prescription for Aricept just as well as the neurologist can. And then finally, they go to a specialist when things are farther along. And this, here's what the specialist says. I can't help you, but I want to make sure to take your driver's license away. I want to make sure that you can't get long-term care insurance. And once the doctor writes in your chart, memory issues, you cannot get long-term care insurance. And in fact, that's the very first patient that I described in the book. Patient zero came to me in 2012. That was, she had come because she was going to commit suicide. And uh, her friend had actually sent her from Washington, D.C. out to, to San Francisco. So, you go in, the neurologist says, okay, I can't help you, but would you mind coming back every six months so I can do a spinal tap and renew my grant? That's how bad things are today. And we need to change that. This should be a rare disease. So here's from a real evaluation. This is actually at one of the three, there are three sites in the United States that are held up as the absolute gold standards for the NIH. And this is one of them, and I, it's not one on the West Coast. I won't, I won't name it. Um, so this person said, MRI of the brain, blood for CBC, metabolic panel, thyroids B12. I asked the patient and his wife to keep an eye on his disabilities. I prescribed Dinepazil, that's Aricept, five milligrams once per day. So here's what he didn't do for the patient. Didn't ask anything about the genetics. Why is this person getting this disease? Nothing about HSCRP, nothing about whether there's any sort of inflammation going on, something really important to know. Nothing about the homocysteine, even though we know that is a critical player in atrophy of your brain. Nothing about your fasting insulin, which is absolutely critical. Part of Alzheimer's disease is developing insulin resistance in your brain. So we want to know where you stand there. Nothing about the hormonal status, even though that's an important support for your neurons. Nothing about toxin exposure, even though we find repeatedly that these are critical players in developing cognitive decline. Nothing about the status of the innate immune system. When we make the amyloid that we associate with Alzheimer's, that molasses-like stuff in your brain, it is part of your innate immune system's response. So what it's really doing is saying, you've been insulted by something. And what we've come to realize with our research is that making this amyloid, the very stuff that the drug companies are trying to get rid of, it is actually a protective response to different types of insults. It's a good antimicrobial, as Dr. Robert Moyer and Dr. Rudy Tanzi at Harvard showed a few years ago, but it's also responding when you have things like toxins, metals, uh, biotoxins, or decrease in your overall nutritional support. So this amyloid that we vilify in Alzheimer's disease is very much like napalm. If you're in a country and they're coming across the border and you're worried, you can put down the napalm to try to kill the invaders, but of course, in so doing, you're decreasing the amount of the arable soil, right? You're living in a smaller country now, and that's exactly what we see in Alzheimer's disease. You are responding with a protective response to different types of insults, but in so doing, you are decreasing the size of your neural network. So therefore, when we prevent it and treat it, we look at all the things that are contributing to that, we remove all those, we optimize all of the support, and then we start the build-back process. 
Okay, so he also prescribed a drug without even a diagnosis. Interestingly, this particular patient had a BMI of 33. How many people know their BMI? Yeah, very good, that's, that's great actually. So it's, yeah, your BMI is just 703 times your weight in pounds divided by your height in inches, and then you divide it by the height in inches again. So it's height in inches squared. And you know, you should run around 20 to 25. So this guy was about 60 pounds overweight. And the neurologist acted as if the head and the body are completely disconnected, that they have nothing to do with each other, and it didn't matter that this guy was way overweight, even though this is an important risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. This guy turned out to have prediabetes, a key risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Wasn't even mentioned, no plan to address that. So again, this is how, this is the gold standard today in our country. So, we want to change things. So if you look at the current standard, it's that there's one cause, we just don't know what it is, it's one disease, and there's one treatment, which is a monotherapy, a single drug, and it doesn't work. But the research shows something very different, the research that we carried out at the Buck Institute. So first of all, what we found, as I mentioned, there are at least 36 different contributors, all these things that I mentioned, like homocysteine and insulin resistance and things like that. What we found then, and we published this a couple years ago, there are actually subtypes. Not everybody gets this for the same reasons. And in fact, everybody has different contributors to this. So there are subtypes, and you need to treat them differently. And then finally, there are many different treatments and there's actually a personalized program and so we actually wrote a computer-based algorithm that will generate, you know, here's the subtype you have and here are the things and we're trying to make this available all over the world, make it easier and easier to get at this. So we wanna change the way we think about this because things have been so unsuccessful with this particular illness. So we wanna shift the paradigm. So I wanna show you a couple of real patients now. Um, and this first one here, 67-year-old, and she's actually now 74. She's doing great. She came way back in, in uh, 2012. She was actually just ready to have her 68th birthday back then. Her mother died with dementia. Pretty typical person, uh, unable to navigate on the freeway. She would be driving along and she just couldn't remember where she was. Very typical story. Couldn't remember what she had read. She was a woman who worked for the US government, unable to prepare reports for her work unable to recall even four-digit numbers. She had a retinal scan which showed amyloid, so she really did have the thing we call Alzheimer's disease. And she was treated with what we've come to call RECODE for reversal of cognitive decline, the protocol that we developed and published first back in 2014. And we're just are now publishing another 50 people with documented improvement. So she came back, and I thought actually I would not hear from her again uh, because we had uh, up until that point treated only mice. And of course, the mice never email you and never thank you. Um, but, uh, you know, and, but so she then called me up at my home on a Saturday. Three months later, she said, I can't believe it. I'm back at work full time. You know, my memory's better than it's been in many years. So I asked her, do you mind if I take a little movie when you come back to visit me? And she said, as long as you don't use my name. So you'll see that the people I show you have pixelated faces because they're back at work and they don't want their bosses to know that they've been treated successfully for Alzheimer's disease. So if you'll go ahead and start that. And she talks a little bit here about her Tell story. Tell me a little bit about how things were a year ago. Well, a year ago, I was having a lot of difficulty. I was very frustrated because my memory was poor. Um, I had issues of being spatially disoriented, particularly when I was driving. I would get off the freeway at the wrong exit or not know where I was getting back on, on familiar routes. Um, I would reach in my house for a light switch, I'd reach on the wrong wall, even though I'd always had, the light switch has always been on, on the right side, I'd start reaching to the left. Um, i call my animals uh, a different name, uh, my pets, and I was really worried about it. I was very stressed about it. Um, so it was, a, it was a very stressful time. And how are things at work? I have a, a job that requires a lot of mental uh, analysis, a lot of thinking. Uh, I, you know, I do a lot of research. I have to collect data, and design the study, and then do the analysis and write a report, usually under pressure. And I was finding that I just couldn't complete an assignment. I couldn't think about the analysis. Um, it was just a jumble to me, and I would start procrastinating and putting it off. And the longer I put it off, the more stress I felt. So I was worried that I was not going to be able to continue with my career. And tell me a little bit about how things are now. Things are much improved now. 
Uh, my memory is much better. In fact, I would even go so far as to say I don't think that I have a problem uh, with memory now, uh, which is a great surprise to me from where I was a year ago. When my thinking, um, cognitive ability, ability to do work, ability to do reports, um, I am back into the stream of things, being productive and being able to do my analysis and writing, which is fantastic. And how's the driving? Driving, no problem. I drive at night, I drive in the daytime, um, I know where to get off, where to get on. Um, I'm uh, on, the, on the highway, so I'm, um, I feel like that's a problem. I'm not reaching for the wrong side of the room for the light switch. I'm not calling my pets the wrong name, which I think they're probably grateful for. And how overall are you feeling? I feel great. I feel really, really good. I feel energetic. Uh, I feel more peaceful and calm about my life, but at the same time very enthusiastic. I've even started writing my book. Fantastic. A couple of chapters. Okay, thank you very much. So the most important thing about this woman is that she is now over six years into this and she's still doing great. So when you get what's actually causing the problem, then when you fix it, people stay good. That's the big difference. When you go on a drug, you're basically skirting nature and so you go right back down to declining. You get a little bump and then you go right back down again. So in this particular woman's case, she went off it four times, went off the program, and each time within about 10 days, she started declining again, she went back on, she got better again. So that's the most important finding so far, that people who get better stay better and the longest are now 60 uh, now six years actually for these people so here's another guy I was going to show you because a very very typical story so he was APOE4 positive so if you have zero copies of APOE4 that's about 75% uh, of Americans or so um, your chance during your lifetime to develop Alzheimer's is about 9%. It's not zero, but it's not terribly high. If you have a single copy, and that's 75 million Americans have one copy of APOE4, your chance is 30% during your lifetime. And if you have two copies, and that's 7 million Americans, and 99% of them don't know it, then your chance is over 50%. Most likely you will develop Alzheimer's during your lifetime. The reality is none of these people should develop Alzheimer's. They should get on a protective and preventive program when they're young so that they don't develop this. In the past, people have said, I don't want to know if I have this gene because there's nothing that can be done about it. And in fact, that's what James Watson, the original DNA sequence, he said, the only gene I don't want to know about for me is my APOE because I don't want to know if I have APOE4 because there's nothing I can do, which is completely wrong now. There's a lot you can do about it. So this guy began to have problems when he was in his late 50s. He found out he was APOE4 positive. He had a PET scan, which was very typical for Alzheimer's. He had neuropsych testing in 2003, 2007, 2013, and you could see him going down. And in fact, the latest one, which often happens with people, they went along, they go along, and then they really fall off the end, which is what happened to him, and which is why his wife brought him to see me at the end of 2013 progressive loss, his California verbal learning test, which is a common one that's abnormal in Alzheimer's, he'd gone from 84th percentile to the third percentile. So he really wasn't remembering much. Unable to remember lock combination, faces, schedule, and so forth and so on. Difficulty at work. Interestingly, this guy had something for his entire adult life. He'd been able to add columns of numbers very, very quickly in his head. And he would look at it with his accountants and say, oh yeah, that's about 430,000. He's like, wow, you're really quick. He he lost that with his Alzheimer's. He got it back on the program, and he still has it to this day. And interestingly, he had improvement. In most of these people, it takes three to six months. Uh, you have to live this program for three to six months because you're really changing something that's been going on for typically 10 to 20 years. And so he got much, much better. But his wife called me up and she said, you know, you're missing the most important thing. And I said, well, what do you mean? She said, yeah, okay, he's getting better. She said, but the thing that was really striking was that he was accelerating in his decline prior to December 2013 when I saw him. And she said that just completely stopped the acceleration. He stabilized and then after a while he started getting better. So he talks a little bit here, if you can start that, he talks a little bit here about his story. There we go and went to open the locker at my gym and I could not remember the combination. Which is, in, as I know myself, that'd be very unusual. 
and I would meet with my accountant, say, and we would just toss out some numbers, and I would have the number faster that he'd get to his computer usually. So things like that uh, started to wane uh, dramatically. Okay, and then if you go to the, the next one here. And went to open the locker at my gym, and I could not remember the combination. Here, let's, okay, try it again there. Clearly, I mean, the math has come back. That's a real measurable thing. I mean, I'm fast with math again. People I had met, maybe even taken to lunch, I did not know who they were. I mean, it's like a new, new encounter. And then afterwards, they'd say, uh, you actually know this person. So that's gone away, which is a relief. Yeah. So this guy's been on now for four and a half years. He's doing great. And after he'd been on for about uh, two years, as you can see here, I asked him, would you please go back? You need to, we need to see where you stand. We need to see where you are from your baseline. And he said, look, I don't want to go back. He said, I know, I know I'm better. My wife knows I'm better. My coworkers know I'm better. I really don't want the neuropsychologist who really was, who had told me, you know, there's, you have Alzheimer's, nobody gets better from this. I don't want him to tell me that I'm not doing well because I think I am. So we finally convinced him, look, this could help other people. Let's find out what, what's going on here. So he went back and you can see here the results. So here his CVLT2, dramatic improvements. Um, his, uh, you can see here his auditory delayed memory from 13th percentile to 79th percentile. Reverse digit span, 24th to 74th. So he really did not only feel better, not only perform better, but in fact, analysis of him, of him showed, in fact, that he was much, much better. And in general, this is what we're finding. When people and their families know they're better, they really are better, and when you test them, they are better. So I wanna show you one more guy here, very interesting because he had a very interesting MRI scan. Actually, this is the MRI scan I showed on Dr. Oz a few months ago. So his family history was positive in both, both parents. He came to me when I was at UCLA in 2014, and he said, look, both my parents died with Alzheimer's, and he said, I'm having problems now. This guy's actually a physician. And he said, look, he's got, he's a, got one copy of APOE4, he had an amyloid PET markedly positive. So he very clearly was in the early stages of Alzheimer's. Now, interestingly, his HSCRP, which is telling you, does he have ongoing systemic inflammation? It should be less than 1.0. His was 10 times as high as it should be. Homocysteine, which shouldn't be more than seven, his was double what it should be. His vitamin D, which we like to see in the 50 to 80 range, 21. I said to him, you're a doctor. You're not checking your vitamin D. He said, you know, I don't believe this stuff. So the bottom line was he was telling me nothing that I was telling him was right. And this, you know, I said, I don't believe this. I don't believe that. I don't believe this. So I finally said to the guy, look, <clears throat> give me six months. If I can't make you better in six months, then go somewhere else. He said, there is no other place. I said, well, okay, <laughs> give, give me six months. So after three months, his wife called me and she said, I can't believe how much better he is. And by the way, he's now treating his patients with this protocol. <clears throat> his testosterone was too low, his thyroid was too low, and he responded absolutely beautifully, metabolically, cognitively, volumetrically. The neurologist called me and said, he's normal, he's doing great. And so here's, <clears throat> here are his numbers. You can see here, whoops, there we go. His fasting insulin, which shouldn't be more than five, <clears throat> was 32. It's not perfect. He's not perfect yet, but he's way better than he was. HSCRP, again, this should be less than one. He's not perfect, but he's way better than he was. Homocysteine, again, he's almost there. His vitamin D3, he's almost there. Here he was struggling, here he's working full time. So I tried to convince this guy to go back after he'd been on for 10 months and get a follow-up MRI scan. We wanna know what the volume of your hippocampi is because this is something that is associated, and his had been low, 17th percentile. And he said to me, you don't grow new brain. And I said, well look, there have been reports that people who just do exercise, just that part alone, have seen small increments in the size of their hippocampi. So I said, let's just see where you stand. So he went back and it was a 75th percentile and the neuroradiologist said, we made a mistake. And I said, well, what do you mean? I mean, he's doing so much better. He said, this is impossible. So we actually had to get the films. I had to take them to a separate place that had a computer read of them and that showed exactly what you see here, that this 
guy really did increase the size of his hippocampus, and he's doing, he's doing great. And so here also, his gray matter, this is the same guy, his gray matter increased by 23%. So he had dramatic response of his brain, which was in the early part of Alzheimer's disease to this approach. So how do we do this? What do we do to reverse it? First of all, the most important thing, we ask what is causing it? Instead of just saying, you know, this is car not working syndrome, and this is Alzheimer's, we ask what is actually causing this problem? And here's what the molecular biology that we studied for all those years taught us. That this is a balance that is affected by several fundamentally different processes. One is, Anything that causes chronic inflammation, whether it's because you have bad dentition or because you've been exposed to Lyme disease or because you're exposed to other microorganisms or because you have a leaky gut and because you have a sedentary lifestyle. Any of these things that causes chronic inflammation will increase your likelihood of Alzheimer's. And we can follow the very molecules that mediate that. And then secondly, very differently, anything that causes suboptimal support of your brain. If you can think about it for a minute, your brain has approximately one quadrillion connections. It's really amazing how many connections. You've got a tremendous supercomputer inside your skull. When you can't support it because you have too little nerve growth factor, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, vitamin B12, vitamin D, estradiol, progesterone, pregnenolone, thyroid, testosterone, all these things contribute. And so what does your brain do when it doesn't have what it needs to keep that tremendous network going? It says, well, I can keep a smaller network going. And that's exactly what happens. So what we do with these people is look to see why their network is too small, and we support them to give them optimal things for the network. And we call that, by the way, type 2 Alzheimer's, or atrophic or cold. And then the, what we call type 1.5 is insulin resistance and glycotoxicity. Do they have that? So what happens when you have chronic, and in fact, sugar is one of the most important contributors to cognitive decline in the Western world. When you have chronic high levels of sugar, what do you do? You make chronic high levels of insulin. So number one, your neurons that need insulin for survival turn off the insulin. It's just as if you have a son who's playing really, really loud rock and roll music for years. What do you do? You put earmuffs on. Then someone plays a Brahms lullaby, you can't hear it. And that's exactly what happens in the brains of the patients who are exposed to the sugar for years. They have these high levels of insulin, so they actually shut off the response. You can actually measure this at the molecular level. It's a change in what's called the phosphorylation of a molecule called IRS1. So literally, your brain is saying, too much, too much insulin. I'm going to turn down the volume. Well, now you have a normal amount. You come start coming down. You can't respond to it. Then the other thing is the glucose itself will glom on to lots of your different proteins, just like remoras on a shark. And the proteins don't work as well, just like a shark can't swim as fast when it's got 60 remoras stuck to it, right? So we measure this as hemoglobin A1c, but there are many other proteins that have the sugar stuck to them. They don't work right. Your vessels don't work right. Your brain cells don't work right. And then the real surprise was what we call type 3 or toxic Alzheimer's. Whether it's metallotoxins like mercury or copper, or it's organic toxins like DDT, or whether it is biotoxins like toxins from molds, all of these things engender this same response from your brain. You make this amyloid to bind up these toxins. So, okay, we want to find those toxins and we want to flush them out of your system. And until we do that, you don't get better. 
And then, do you have vascular compromise? We call that type 4 Alzheimer's disease because that is a part of Alzheimer's. And then finally, have you had significant head trauma? That is type 5. And we do see people who've had head trauma. And what happens when you have head trauma? You produce this amyloid. Same idea. Okay, so what do we do then? So we use an algorithm that we developed to subtype each person and to address each contributor. So. Here we go. We want you, and this is, you know, again, this is something where when I went to medical school at Duke, there was one course on nutrition, and it was optional. You didn't have to take it. So I took the course, and I basically learned one thing, that vitamin C is thermolabile. Okay, that's what I learned in that whole course. So the bottom line is, Nutrition turns out to be way more important than anybody taught me in medical school. And we're starting to realize that in fact, what we're trying to do to make you better with your cognition is to drive you toward the biochemistry that supports cognition. And most of us don't have that biochemistry. So part of it is what we call a KetoFlex 12-3 diet. We're driving people into mild ketosis so that instead of using sugar for your brain, you're using ketones. Ketones come from breaking down fats. And so we have to convert you over. So DESS, diet, exercise, sleep, and stress. Nobody told me in medical school how important these are. They are incredibly important, but they're the beginning. Then you're gonna to add to that. So that's the thing. We want a plant-rich, ketogenic diet. We want you to get a ketone meter, $25, easy to do, and you want your ketones to be around 1.5 millimolar to four millimolar. And I put here one, we used to think you could go down a little lower. We're finding out that the patients who do the best are more toward the higher levels, 1.5, 2, 3, or 4. We want exercise, cardio, and strength. So actually, living here is a fantastic advantage because everybody's outdoors doing great things, and it really does help. This should be a place for very rare cognitive decline. Sleep. 70% of people who have sleep apnea go undiagnosed during their lifetimes. So if to, you know, get your partner to, to watch, you guys watch each other for 10 or 15 minutes and see if you snore, see if you stop breathing. The snoring tells you it might be coming, but the important thing is if you actually stop breathing. If so, please check with your doctor, borrow an oximeter for a couple of nights, you just put it on your finger, and you can see if your oxygen is desaturating. One of the people I worked with checked it out. She said, I didn't think I had it, but when I checked it out, 260 events per night. She now has zero events per night and is doing much, much better. So this is an important contributor and one that we usually don't find out about. Stress, huge issue. If you have high levels of cortisol, this actually makes your hippocampus shrink. Very common problem. We as human beings evolved to have stress come and go, but not to have it you know, chronically, and in fact, many of us live in a chronic world of stress. Brain training turns out to be very helpful, especially when you do it with the right biochemistry background. Heal your gut. Many of us have leaky gut. Having probiotics and prebiotics and healing the gut really helps. And then optimizing your immune system, your methylation, your detox, your hormones, your trophic factors, and your overall metabolism turn out to be really powerful to get rid and to prevent this problem. And then if you have specific pathogens, you can target those. We want to know how many people here have ever been checked to see if they had Babesia. Okay, nobody. And we're finding a number of people that until you find the Babesia and get rid of it, and by the way, Babesia is a cousin of malaria. How do you get Babesia in the United States? A tick bites you, and when he gives you the Lyme disease, which you often get treated, you get rid of the Lyme, the Babesia is still there. The ticks can carry up to 70 different organisms. So in fact, just because you got a tick bite and you tr were treated for Lyme, or maybe you were checked for Lyme and you didn't have it, that doesn't mean that you uh, avoided all of the other pathogens. So if you've got these other pathogens, get it checked out. Target identified toxins. If you've got high levels of mercury, you want to know. So I had a guy who called me a couple of years ago, and the guy said, you know, he had, he'd already had a PET scan. He already was early stage Alzheimer's. And he said, you know, um, I'm having, he was only 54, and a lot of the young ones turn out to have type 3. 
the type that we see with toxins. So I told him, you have type 3, which means you have some toxin. We just have to find out what it is. He said, no, I live a very clean life. Everything's great. Well, it turned out he had the highest level of mercury that the laboratory had seen in five years. If you go to the 95th percentile, he had seven times the 95th percentile. And by the way, he's doing great after being treated for his very high mercury. And what had happened, he had become so successful that he decided that the right thing to do was to eat tuna sushi three times a week. And he unfortunately had a genetics that was not good at getting rid of it. So it was a perfect storm. He also had dental amalgams, the old fashioned dental fillings. So he had inorganic mercury from here, organic mercury from here, and then a poor ability to excrete it, or literally a perfect storm, which is why it was so high. Optimize the vascular system, and then we've been now, some people need stem cells on top of this. And stem cell treatment is coming, and there are some trials. But the idea here is that people are trying to do these trials. It's like trying to build back the house while it's burning down. Okay, we want to put out the fire first. We want to make sure that everything's right. Then you add the stem cells. So the first few people that have done this um, have gotten good responses to them. So we just finish up over the next few minutes to talk about how does this actually work. So what we found is that these chronic illnesses, whether you talk about osteoporosis or cancer or Alzheimer's, they are imbalances. Literally, when you get a neurodegenerative disease, it is because you have a chronic or repeated mismatch between the supply and the demand, just like a company. If you've got too little supply and too much demand, you're going down. You just, if you just don't have what it takes to keep that brain alive, the brain starts getting smaller. So we need to look at all the things on the supply side and all the things on the demand side. Cancer, same idea. Cytoblastic is greater than cytoclastic. So you're literally making cells more quickly than you're turning them over. And what we discovered is that Alzheimer's is no different. There's a whole set of things in your brain that cause synaptoblastic, literally making connections. And then there's a whole set of things that are synaptoclastic, literally pulling back, reorganizing. And when you're young, you have a beautiful balance between synaptoblastic and synaptoclastic activity. But as we get older, Various nutrients, all the things that I showed you, make it so that this side is too little, synaptoblastic, and this side is too big. Okay, so we can now measure this. We can measure the biochemistry, and everybody has got this to be too short when they have Alzheimer's, and this side is too long. So we measure all the things that contribute to it, and then we can actually do something about it. And you can actually look at the molecule that gives you the amyloid, and what you can see is that it's a molecular switch. This thing is this thing right here, amyloid precursor protein. This is outside your cell, this is inside your cell. If you cut it here, you make two things here that are trophic, that are anti-Alzheimer's. And if you cut it here, 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 you have four pieces that all tell you come back. This is literally, if you've got not enough coming in, then literally your CEO is going to say, we have got to pull back. And when you pull back at a company, what's the first thing that goes? Hiring new people, right? And that's why the first thing for many of these people, they lose the ability to make new memories. They're still good. They can still drive. They can still play tennis. They can still do many things for years, but they can't learn new information. And that's because they don't have enough support to support that. And other, the things that are downstream then come from this. Now, people have tried to say, let's just prevent this cleavage. But again, you're tricking the way it actually works. And so no surprise, your body's too smart. It goes around that and finds other ways. So in a mouse, we could change this really easily because the mouse is actually, it's called Mausheimer's. We're producing it with a gene. In humans, we wanted to know what are all the things that contribute to that balance, whether you're going to make synapses or whether you're going to pull them back. And we published this a few years ago, and I only show it to say humans are complicated. They're much more complicated than mice, and they have many things from your inflammation, all the things we talked about, your insulin, all that. So the big test then for our theory when we first came out with this was, okay, APOE is the gene that is the most common genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's, which is why we should all know our status and we should all address that with an appropriate program. It's known that 
<clears throat> the gene itself here, the end result for many people is Alzheimer's. But nobody knew what's in the middle here. So we started a program to understand this, and it was absolutely fascinating what came out of this. And I call this the chimp that killed the rhino. So if you go back five to seven million years ago, and <clears throat> you had the common ancestor to chimps and, and hominids, so you have the simians and the hominids, and it turns out they're actually very similar genetically. In fact, when I told my wife, do you know that my DNA as a whole is actually more similar to a male chimp DNA than it is to your DNA? And she said, well, duh. So, <clears throat> right? So, yeah, I mean, you know, you both like ESPN, you both like the Three Stooges, right? So she wasn't that surprised, needless to say. But what happened? God came down, right, and touched us touched the simians with DNA, and only a small number of changes occurred to make hominids. It's amazing how similar they are. So we became this new thing, and the surprise was that the small number of changes that took us from chimp to human, many of them are pro-inflammatory, the very thing that we're trying to prevent when we take fish oil. What the heck, why is that? Well, it turned out, and this was actually suggested by Professor Tuck Finch of University of Southern California, and I think Tuck is absolutely right. What he found was that, what does it take to come down out of the trees? Well, you come down out of the trees, you're now a hominid, you step on dung, you puncture your feet, you fight with your brethren, you fight with your food. So you have to have a pro-inflammatory state. And in fact, even today, the people who are living in the third world, people who are living in squalor, actually survive better if they have ApoE4. It is a pro-inflammatory gene. So it's a great thing under certain circumstances. But if you're living in an, a first world country, then in fact it helps you get rid of various pathogens when you're young, but this chronic inflammation gives you heart disease, Alzheimer's disease, and you don't have as much longevity. Okay, we can fix that. We look when you're young, we can put you on a program, and there's a wonderful website, by the way, apoe4.info, started by a woman named Julie G, who's actually on our program. She's gone from 35th percentile in her testing to 98th percentile. She's absolutely wonderful. And she has followed this approach, and she is an APOE 4.4. So she's one of the 7 million Americans who has two copies and was already experiencing some cognitive decline. So if you look at these, they actually look quite different. APOE4, the one that puts you at risk for Alzheimer's, looks like columns. APOE3 looks like a nutcracker, and that's because of actually this one additional mutation here, which allows this to come together and allows this one to swing freely. So if you go back to what our history as hominids, for 96% of our history, Everybody was APOE 4.4, the very thing that's relatively uncommon now, 7 million Americans. And just in the last 220,000 years, APOE 3. So I check myself. I'm a 3.3, which is like vanilla. That's the common one. So I'm at about a 9% risk during my lifetime for Alzheimer's disease. Well, this only started just recently here. And then APOE 2 just 80,000 years ago. So most of human history, we've all been APOE 4.4. And what we found, to make a very long story very short, is that this thing actually works by getting into the cell and actually surprisingly interacting with another molecule, which is related to inflammation, and binding to DNA. So the very molecule, APOE4, that we always thought of as your butcher, it's the guy who carries the fat, carries fat around. That's what APOE does. Not only is he the butcher, he's also your senator. He's making the laws of the land. 1,700 different genes are controlled by this APOE. And if you put this, and you say, okay, what are the groups of genes? You could not tell a better story for Alzheimer's disease. So you can actually see why these people are at risk, and you can do something about it. So here's what this means when you look at all these different contributors. And we, we spent years trying to develop Alzheimer's drugs, and actually we have one in trial currently uh, that's in Australia in trial. So here's what a perfect Alzheimer's drug would have to do. 
This is what you have to have to have a perfect Alzheimer's drug. And this is why it has been so tough and why we need to look at what's actually causing it. Now, drugs are going to be very important for Alzheimer's as part of an overall program. That's the way things need to go. So this is why we say, you've got a roof with 36 holes, let's figure out what they are. And we need to train a new kind of physician. And your local physician, Dr. Marisich, who's also an Olympian, as well as being, uh, and thank you for service to your country, um, an Olympian as well as a wonderful doctor understands this kind of thing. This is a new kind of doctor, right? We need to have the doctor. Whoops, we kind of lost the good part there. There we go. This is better. So the 20th century doctors knew a lot about DNA and RNA, right? But they didn't know about the whole system. The traditional Chinese doctors knew that the whole body works together. We need to train a new kind of physician who gets this. So this is why I wrote this book, to talk a little bit about you know, what these cases were, how, how did we figure this out? And the bottom line is that we need to think about health. We need to think about prevention and treatment in a completely different way. It's no longer one size fits all, write a, you know, write a prescription, very different. So just like we've gone from taxis to Uber and to Lyft and things like that, the consumer has more power and more responsibility. Check out your health. We need much larger data sets. People checking your sodium and your potassium and telling you we don't know why you had Alzheimer's. That's 20th century medicine. Programmatics, not monotherapeutics. We want to get you on the optimal program. We can identify your initial risk based on your genome. Do you have ApoE4? Your metabolome, these various things. And we can then prevent, and this should be, therefore, a rare disease with a personalized approach. So we need computer-based algorithms to determine the subtypes, the optimal programs. We're doing a, a trial that's just starting out. It's called the Four Winds Trial, and it's a collaboration between a bunch of, uh, of different groups. And so this is the, just the first 50 people. So this is just starting, should finish next year. Um, but we've now, meanwhile, seen hundreds of people get better. So just to, to summarize then, Alzheimer's should actually be a rare disease. What we refer to as Alzheimer's disease is the result of a protective response to these four major metabolic and toxic perturbations. Inflammation, insulin resistance and glycotoxicity, trophic withdrawal, and specific toxins. These are the things that actually drive it. Therefore, there's these four major subtypes, and you can see them readily if you just do the appropriate testing. Cognitive decline in early Alzheimer's and its forerunners, MCI, which is mild cognitive impairment, and SCI, is reversible when you're actually seeing what's causing it. And we should be able to prevent it in almost everybody. Most important, when we get people better, they sustain that improvement. This programmatic approach should be applicable to others. So we're now working with people with macular degeneration, with Parkinson's, with Lewy body, with Lou Gehrig's, to make variations, again, to look at what's actually causing their neurodegeneration. And the bottom line is we should be able to reduce the global burden of dementia markedly and chronic illness as a whole. Not only that, for people who are not having these illnesses, to make them sharper, to make them better. They should actually do better. Fewer plane crashes, fewer car crashes, things like that. Through metabolic profiling, larger data sets, prevention and early reversal, and then what I call PRPs, patient researcher partnerships, where you work with a person who is at the very beginning of this and say, okay, what are all the things? What hasn't been found? And this is actually a very powerful partnership that you can begin to find out what's causing this for each person. So again, thank you so much for the invitation. Great to be in your beautiful valley here. And please, get out there, get yourself checked out, and make sure that you don't undergo cognitive decline. And happy to take questions. Okay, some questions. And I think... Okay, and I think there's a microphone. Is this over here? Yeah, so here's a microphone. Okay, and there's another one. Uh, there's another one over here, sorry. So there's a microphone here and a microphone here. Okay, sign yeah. me up for this program. Okay, <laughs> This is amazing. Great. I mean, That's... it really is amazing, but here's where... My question goes to, okay. my question is, okay, insurance companies obviously are not going to cover something like this. So yeah. this is something that, unfortunately, a lot of us common folk can't really 
afford to do because a regular doctor really can't, I guess they can prescribe all the testing, yes. but the insurance is not going to pay for that. Okay, so here's, here's where this stands. So first of all, you're absolutely right. So I've actually talked to some insurance companies about, you know, if you look at what it costs for one year of a nursing home, um, getting all these tests costs less than 1% of that. So yeah, we want to keep everybody out of nursing homes. That's the first piece. Second piece is uh, there should be dementia insurance. Just as there's life insurance, why don't we have dementia insurance? We should. And I talked to one of the insurance companies that said, yeah, after you've done this in 10,000 people and shown that they all improve, they'll give us a call. So you know they, they don't want to take any sort of any no. sort of risk. And I get it. It's about risk. So you know we'll get there. But um, what we've done recently is we've been able to get insurance to pay for some of this, so that um, what the original tests, the total to get all the tests, to get the report, to get everything, cost a, cost about thirteen hundred dollars. So now we can do it for four ninety nine. Nice. With so we have a website you can actually go on this. So we're getting it better. The goal is of course to make it as you know as free as we can to everybody. We'd like to make it so that everybody around the world prevents this illness. Absolutely. Exactly. So things are getting better and I agree with you. There's always this issue about what's reimbursed and what's not. But I think things will get better as people see that you actually can prevent cognitive decline. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. I have a question. Um, what if someone has been suffering cognitive decline for two years, four years, six no. years, slowly you've seen it happening. And now um, it's a friend of mine who's been diagnosed with dementia with Lewy body. Yeah. And probably has Parkinson's too. Yeah. It, what can he do? Yeah. So, of course, this is what Robin Williams died from, uh, Lewy body dementia. Right. And right. there are one million Americans with Lewy body dementia. It's the second most common after Alzheimer's for dementia in this country. Um, it's a big problem. Um, on the other hand, it does tend to respond, and we are finding that the type 1 and type 2 Alzheimer's are like cousins of each other. The type 3 that have the, the toxins are actually more similar to Parkinson's and Lewy body. So, with people with Lewy body and Parkinson's, we always find toxin exposure. You're absolutely right. We want to get it as early as possible. And what we're finding is, the later you get it, the harder it is to reverse the problem. So, if the person is someone who doesn't want to go through a program, I wouldn't recommend going through this program. You want to do early and you want to, and it takes some effort. We get health coaches and we find that it definitely works better if you have a spouse who works with you. Right. Um, but for some people, yes, we do see improvements with Lewy body. Now, we did have a person uh, a year ago who came to an immersion program we had down in uh, Palm Desert. And this person had a MOCA score of zero, so she couldn't speak, she couldn't dress herself, she couldn't do any of this stuff. Um, she got on the program, and she, I was, to my surprise actually, she can now speak, dress herself, email, talks to people, all this, dances with her husband. Now, she's not back to normal yet, and we'll mm -hmm. see what happens. She was a good candidate now for stem cells. She ended up having very heavy, heavy exposure to biotoxins. And when those were removed, she started doing better. Um, so. You know, I has always hesitate to tell people there's a cutoff. It's not black and white, but it is true. The earlier you get it, the yeah. better, the easier, the more complete, and the less you have to do. Because mm -hmm. the way this works is there's a threshold. By the way, no different than what Dean Ornish saw 30 years ago with cardiovascular disease. Mm -hmm. You have a threshold. When you get over that threshold, you stop putting down plaque in your arteries. You start picking up the plaque, which is exactly what he showed. We see the same thing here. You have to get over that threshold. The farther are you are along, the harder it is to get over the threshold. But it doesn't mean it can't be done. And you can tell where it is with someone individually. Well, you can't tell where you the threshold is until they start improving. So you, you have to, that's why you gotta keep working with them until they actually start showing some improvement. So you're right, it is tough. And that's why, in general, we wanna get everybody to come in as early, early as possible. The people who have SCI, which is the beginning, subjective cognitive impairment, so there are four stages. There's pre-symptomatic, SCI, MCI, mild cognitive impairment, and then full-blown Alzheimer's. The people who have SCI, 
all of them get better. It's, it's just striking. They all get better. Yeah. The people who have MCI, most of them get better. The people who have Alzheimer's, some of them get better. So the earlier, the easier it is. And you, the tests show which one you have and how much. Yeah, exactly. Okay, and that's yeah. So we say everybody should have a cognoscopy. We all know that when we turn 50, right, we get a colonoscopy. Uh, my, my wife and I had his and hers on Valentine's Day. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, so we were happy to see that we're both okay, great. Um, but you know, it's one of those unpleasant things you just have to live with. But in fact, a cognoscopy is less unpleasant. Yeah. Um, it's some blood testing and, and it's a simple online test to see. By the way, I should mention one interesting thing. A lot of people who come to us for prevention, they say, oh, this is you know, rampant in my family and I better check, or you know, my grandmother died of Alzheimer's. They say, I think I'm asymptomatic, but when they actually get tested, they're already in the earliest stages. Because what mm -hmm. happens is you don't notice because it's, it's a slow right. change. And the SCI lasts about a decade. So we actually oh. have a big window to make people better, but Even get them in. when you're diagnosed with Lewy body and doesn't matter what, yeah, no matter what it is, but again, no the earlier is. is better. And so okay. the thing is, you have this, you know, you have this window so that you, you, know, you should be able to actually to get in you know, early. Um, so Thank anyway, you. that's that's where Thank that stands. You. Yes, ma'am. So a friend of mine has been diagnosed with uh, MCI yeah. and has gone on your protocol. And she said, she said, well, I haven't seen anything. Uh, I haven't seen any improvement, but I think I'm going to die from the diet. <laughs> So, could you talk a little bit about yeah. the stress from, from the protocol? Yeah. So, so here's the thing. That's, that's a, it's a great point. So, how long has she been on? I think three months. Yeah. So, yeah. Give it, give it six months. Um, is she checking her ketone status? I'll have to ask. I'm not yeah. sure. So, this is, you know, this is a little bit like doing surgery. You want to do it with someone who knows what they're doing. Right? You don't want to just try this on your own. So first thing is, she needs to make sure, and is she thin or not? Because if you're thin, it's a little harder, actually, because you don't have the fat to generate the ketones initially. And so they actually often have to take exogenous, ketone salts or ketone esters. She's actually lost about 20 pounds, I think, from the anxiety of the well, MCI the, and, and yeah. trying to deal with it. Everybody loses a little bit of weight because you're now no longer giving yourself the, the sugar. Um, which jumps up your weight, gives you metabolic syndrome, gives you hypertension. So we have one guy who said, yeah, I'm a little bit better. He said, I said, well, how are you doing overall? He said, well, I was able to come off my statin, my cholesterol's good, able to come off my antihypertensive, and able to come off my anti-diabetic medication. Wow, you're doing pretty well. Okay, and his cognition is beginning to improve. So these are things we shouldn't have things like metabolic syndrome. None of us should have those. They're because of the way we live. So here's the thing. She needs to make sure to get herself. Does she have a good doctor she's working with? And does she have a health coach? She, all of those in the Bay Area, yes. Okay. So she needs to get her ketones up and make sure that they're above 1.5 millimolar of beta-hydroxybutyrate. She needs to, if she's losing weight, you can cycle once or twice a week. You can actually cycle and liberalize a little bit. She needs to know if she has pathogen exposures. So she needs to know, you know, check, there's a thing called DNA connections. You can actually look to see whether you have been exposed to specific tick-borne illnesses. She needs to know if she has type three with the, uh, did, did she have mostly an amnestic presentation, memory, or mostly non-memory? Um, a little bit memory. Okay, yeah. all right. Mostly so, memory. Okay. How old was she when she started her symptoms? Uh, 70. 70, okay. So she most likely has type 2, um, which is an atrophic type, and you need to then support all these things. Has she go on, gone on bioidentical hormone replacement therapy, BHRT? I'm not sure. So, okay, so that's yeah. helpful again to build back things up. And then you want to go on what's called whole coffee fruit extract, which increases your BDNF, which supports the brain. So you need to get on, you, get, you, know, you need to hit all the right notes and then give it a few months, three months is still early, yeah. and then get things to optimize. Is and all of that there, in your book? Yes, yes, and we have a, yes, yeah, all that, yeah, so. Just in the essence of time, we're gonna ask you to keep your questions general and okay. keep moving it along. So I do family practice in Pocatello. It's about yeah. two hours south. Great. And I read your study in 2015, the one from 14, and started yep. following a handful of patients when, back when it was MEND. And yep. I followed approximately about 150 patients. The thing that I've really struggled with is people who are E33s 
or, or non-fours, and yeah. they have obviously a toxic component, you know, yep. atypical dementias, yep. and they're not, they're, they're just the different. Yep. There's not a great algorithm to walk through what testing to do, because as the, as the young lady said earlier, the cost factor is important. So you could watch down the path of toxicity testing through Quicksilver, or do Genova Diagnostics Toxic Core, or doctor's data, and I'm just wondering if you have an algorithm to help with those non-fours so that we can help them manage their primary care budgets and not spend a ton of money trying to yeah. figure out what toxic element they're struggling with. Yeah, so this is all included in a second book. So Random House is now going to publish a second book. It's called The First Survivors of Alzheimer's, and it'll be out next year. But meanwhile, have you been on any of our town hall meetings? All of them. Oh, good, okay. So you know Mary Kay Ross. Very well, is, yeah. Okay, good. So Mary Kay is, a, is an expert. Uh, in biotoxin illness. It sounds like you've got some people who probably do have biotoxin. Mm -hmm. No question, you're right. They are the hardest people to reverse. Interestingly, the ApoE4s that have always been the tough ones are easier really with easy. this sort of That's approach. Right. And it's the E33s that have the toxin exposure that are the tough ones. And as you said, they have atypical presentations. They're typically not starting with amnestic problems. They have executive dysfunction, problems organizing, problems calculating, word finding, things like that. So um, I would start by just doing the standard, do, the, you, know, do you check C4As, TGF beta ones, mm -hmm. all that sort of stuff? All of the shoemaker. And are they mostly stuff. abnormal? Um, no, it, I would say that they're split like 50-50. Sometimes the C4As are very low, but TGF beta ones are elevated. Yeah. And in those individuals, I've shifted over and done um, Quicksilver's tri-test yeah. and, and right. blood metals panel. And, and, and even a couple of those have come back very low which is suggesting Great. that maybe they've sequestered toxins or there's a biotoxin. So I'm just yeah. trying to figure out if there's a better way to identify what tests right. to run at so the, what point in the process. Yeah. So since these are toxin type, it sounds like many of them, um, I would certainly do the DNA connections to see if they have pathogens. But I would also do, um, get, get there's a wonderful book called The Toxin Solution by Dr. Joe Pizzorno. Do you have this book? I so, know, but I'm familiar with some of his chelation that, yeah, protocols. Yeah, because that, that's actually, I think that's very helpful. He has a very good overall approach to toxicity illness. Okay. So I would check that. Great, thanks. Yeah, sure, thank you. May I jump in over here on the other side? Sure, sure, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> for change, yeah. just, just for the other side sure. of the room. Um, I'm curious because in 2010, I lost my husband to Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And at that point, um, it was... Uh, told to both of us that they could not make an actual diagnosis for Alzheimer, al excuse me, Alzheimer's um, until he died and they did a biopsy of his brain because it was too buried, Alzheimer's was too buried in the convolutions right. of the brain. Um, he also had the Louis, Louis body um, uh, syndrome particular to that too. Um, so my question is from 2010 to 2018, is this how far we have come? in the diagnosis of Alzheimer's and at what age should you st start testing because my three boys are very concerned that they will inherit his, his condition. Right, so I tell anyone who has it in the family or has someone who's in the very late stages, get all the children tested. Number one, they want to know. They, they basically want a cognoscopy. You want to know what their APOE status is. is. Is that the problem? And then you want to know their other metabolic and toxic parameters. And we usually suggest that if, you know, when they're 45 or so. Um, if they're younger than 45, you can wait a few years, um, in, unless the person in the family got it at that young age, which is uncommon. So otherwise, yeah, when they hit 45, I would get them checked out. We were also told that um, even though he was not diagnosed, because they didn't, that it can um, start presenting itself 20 years before they actually die. Right. And that if you um, are, if you contract it at an earlier age, you will tend to die more quickly than someone that contracts it later or is diagnosed much later. Right. So the way it works is you have to come to a certain threshold. So if you are, if you've taken a long time to get there, you can see that it's going to take a long time. Whereas if you start earlier, you've already t turned down to get to that point earlier in your life. So it is, it's a general rule. It's not always true. But as a general rule, people who present earlier go more quickly. Uh, and so, yes, we want to get people, again, you want to get it so that they never get to that point. 
and uh, you know everybody who has a parent or even a grandparent or, or relative who has this should consider getting this when they're 45. And, and as far as what's changed, yes, um, you're right, people do it as pathology is the only 100%, but you can tell by PET scans, now there's also a cerebrospinal fluid test for, so there are markers you can use that are you know 95% accurate. Uh, very accurate in general. Um, you don't have to have an autopsy anymore to see for sure. And alcohol. How yeah. much does that bear on this? Um, alcohol, um, it does increase the likelihood, as does smoking, um, but it's not a huge player. The, the bigger players are the toxin exposure, the pathogens, uh, the metabolism, the um, you know, glycotoxicity, as I was mentioning, and the chronic inflammation. Those are the big players. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yes. First of all, I want to say thank you because this gives a lot of hope. It's rampant in my family, grandmother, aunts, father. Um, so what I'm curious about is what are the resources? Because even three months ago at my dad's last appointment, his neurologist said, there's nothing we can do. Just live the best life you can. So it sounds like you have a protocol. How do normal people like us access that? So uh, what's his MOCA score? I'm sorry. Do you know his MOCA score or where is So I don't know any of his numbers and, or can, mine. I'm just thinking. Can like, he drive? Can he, he dress himself? And, he can dress himself, yeah. Okay. Can he talk to you? Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, check out the book. Um, okay. Check out specifically um, chapters 7, 8, and 9. Okay. Those are the ones that talk about this. Um, I don't know, I'm not having seen him, of course I can't tell, but I would at least take him to a doctor who's familiar with this and ask where do things stand. Again, and are those the farther resources? along, the tougher it is. So in Idaho, unfortunately, we don't have that many neurologists who believe in this. <laughs> so where do, is it in the, in you the book? You have a local one who's right here. Okay. <laughs> but in the book, is there a resource list that says who There's a to? website uh, yeah. that you can actually go on. There's, there's a, a website right now called AHNP Health. Dot com, okay. And you can go on there, and you, so you can get this, and you can get the insurance deduction for okay. it, so that it's actually you know, much easier to get, um, and you can get a report and all that. So ahnphealth.com. Okay, thank you yeah, so much. you're welcome. <laughs> you, may, you may have already answered my question. Okay. And that's uh, a resource to go to. Yeah. My brother's uh, nine years older than I am. Yeah, he's, uh, for 40 years, he's an uh, ophthalmologist. <coughs> And he is, so I'm 73, 82, yeah. and, and I'm going to buy your book. He, could, he can't read it. Yeah. But what he can do is something like your presentation right here or something online that can be a resource that he can look at. Yeah. So AHMP? AHNPHealth.com, I would check there. And then does he have a spouse or a health coach, someone oh, yeah. that can work with him? Yeah, because yeah. obviously it sounds like he can't do a lot of these things on his own. No, he is yeah. also, he's AFib and uh, he has... Yeah, I'm uh, sorry. So he is, he on, uh, is he on Coumadin? Parkinson's. Or he's on, yes, he's on a warfarin yeah. type base. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I don't want to give false hope for people who have, no. who are very late stage and yeah. have multiple medical conditions. No. It's tough. We're yeah. trying to heal the underlying biochemistry. Sure. And if there are many, many things, you know, that may or may not be helpful. Yeah, better, better shot than none. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yes. This might be a bit facetious, but we all kid about senior moments, yes. and the senior moments are getting worse. Are we playing with fire? Well, you know, th this is what's happened because, you know, everything has been backwards. We want to say, well, look, it's probably not Alzheimer's because if it is, there's nothing we can do about it. So we just keep saying, oh, senior moments probably aren't Alzheimer's. Well, but senior moments are not right. You shouldn't be having senior moments. And in fact, that one guy I showed you, that's the way he started, senior moments. It's a common thing. He ended up having you know, Alzheimer's and he's done very, very well. So yes, if you're having senior moments, I would get checked out, see what your blood tests show, mm -hmm. see where you stand and see if you can improve it. And you should be able to. Again, when you're just having the senior moments, you're not that far along. And as you indicated, it doesn't mean you're headed for Alzheimer's, but it means that something's not working correctly and it's often fixable. Well, we'll go down as a group. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again. Can you share your website for folks? To go That's for it. more information, is there a website they can yes. visit? Yes, so you can go on to ahnphealth.com. It's probably the easiest one. There's also a website, drbredison.com. Great. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So AHNP, which is Apollo Health New Practices, AHNP Health 
dot com. And you can actually get these, get the testing with the, with the reduction on that site. Great. Join right. me in thanking Thank Dr. Bredesen. Thanks again for the invitation.